Okay, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our illustrious gathering. And uh, tonight we're going to have uh, Jim Garfield from what, the League of Women Voters or something like that, Jim? Independent Voters of Illinois. Close. Okay, IVI. All right. Well, anyway, my apologies. All right, Charlie, uh, let's get uh, the college consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. And our speaker, Jim Garfield, will speak on this topic. Then we'll have a question and answers period, meaning it'll be uh, questions and not, uh, not, and, you know, and then we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where each and every speaker will get a certain amount, set amount of time to uh, come in and, and say what they want to do and say their piece. Now, in two weeks, we'll be resuming in person meetings at the Dapper's East restaurant, but we will still have the uh, Zoom cast going on. So, We'll also be meeting about an hour earlier, but Charlie can get into that when we get more into the announcements phase of our illustrious thing. Okay, uh, hang on, Charlie. Here, let me get the uh, let me get the uh, let me get the uh, uh, website up, and then we'll share a screen, and we can go to the uh, as soon as it comes up here. It's not okay. There it is. There it is. We want to welcome to Neil, who is a candidate for the water district. She's in the PowerPoint. Well, that's good. Okay, Charlie, let's get into our announcements period. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,689 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, a little business. Uh, we maintain a Google group, which you are invited to join at the center top of our main website. It takes them one few seconds in order to join the Google group and you'll get a weekly announcement or two, no traffic uh, on the upcoming programs and topic at the College of Complexes. We also maintain a meetup group, which functions much in the same fashion, little or no traffic, except for upcoming uh, announcement of topics. Um, uh, uh, the video of last week's program by State Representative Teresa Ma has been posted uh, in our lecture library, which you are invited to take a look at. Also now, will everyone please mute? That's the red X on the lower left uh, during the presentation that will follow shortly. Okay, although I'm not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next week on October 29th, um, Joe Jennings, who's put together a rather extensive and illustrated PowerPoint presentation and narrative on, on the war in the Ukraine and NATO. So we'll explore the topic and he maintains that he will tell us the truth. He will tell us the truth about this entire episode. So October the 29th, transitioning into November the 1st, we will commence with in-person meetings at the restaurant. I've spoken with them and I will do verify it again during the week and Tim maintains that he will go there as well. But we will try to simulcast uh, the meetings on YouTube and Zoom as well as in person. And Tim assures me by Wednesday, all these arrangements, one way or another, we will have uh, see how we go in that regard. The date is presently open. Uh, a number of individuals said they were wanted to speak. I've not heard from anyone. Right now it's an open microphone or open to anyone who has this, I need a title and a, a brief description in order to book a program. That's November the 5th. On November the 12th, I will be making a, a presentation on how it was communism that defeated fascism in World War II. I've been studying this for a number of years, but we're gonna take a, a look at something most Americans know little or nothing about. And that is, we know all about the war, World War II in the West, and virtually nothing about the war in the East 
that went on for years and years and years prior to D-Day. So we'll be looking at a bit of history and I'm gonna bring it up to date on how communism will defeat fascism again, once again. So I bring the program up to date with current events around our nation right now. That leaves open November the 19th and 26th. If you would like to speak or know of someone, please give me their contact information and we'll try to fill out the schedule. As I say, I was holding it open for the regulars and I have not heard from anyone. So I'm gonna be booking these, apparently gonna to have to resort to booking these on my own unless I hear from some people shortly, which I hope we can do. Anyhow, uh, that's basically it. And let's go, Tim, take it away. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let me get the, uh, all right. Well, uh, Jim, if you're ready, uh, let's get started with your presentation. Don't forget to share screen and I'll uh, mute while we're doing that too as well. So everybody else, if you're there, uh, let's mute while we'll, how, uh, Jim makes his presentation and we'll uh, get started. So Jim, take it away. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for having me here. Uh, I am Jim Garfield, the current state chair of the Independent Voters of Illinois, Independent Precinct Organization, IVI, IPO, which I always shorten to IVI because otherwise it's too many letters all at once. So um, I'm going to have a quick uh, PowerPoint uh, that kind of goes through our organization um, and kind of its history and what it does. And then the topic today was you know, how to be an informed voter. So I'm going to go through some ways to handle that. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of the controls here so that it's not floating in front of the screen. All right. So as I said, we're here from the IVI, Independent Voters of Illinois. And we can see you loud and clear, just so you know. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So this organization has been around uh, the IVI and since 1944. Mm -hmm. Um, the IPO uh, was 1963, I think. Uh, and the two then merged. Actually, get this minimized. There we go. Uh, and the two merged to become the IVI IPO. Uh, and we've been around since, well, you know, past 78 years. Um, and here's, of course, a list of the various governors throughout the years. Some of them are and are not in prison right now. Not, uh, not coming on that. And of course, we've had mayors of Chicago because our organization, uh, while statewide, uh, does in fact uh, interview and, so our organization is, is mostly in Chicago and Cook County, but we are in fact a statewide organization. So we do in fact uh, endorse and uh, interview candidates from across the state for all levels of government. Now, what we do, we're a nonprofit, multi-partisan, independent political organization. What does that mean? It means we interview everyone. We don't care if you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Green Party, a Libertarian, a uh, working class people's party, a, you know, whatever. We don't care. We care about, are you qualified for the job? Are you a good government candidate? Will you be able to handle this, this position? Uh, that's what we care about. So we focus on social justice through good government, increasing voter participation, increasing voter, increasing voter registration, and of course, our endorsements. And we have been on quite a few things, including nuclear weapons freezes, uh, yes to the Equal Rights Amendment, and yes to the fair tax. We haven't always been successful in these things, but the point is that we're fighting for them. Now, if you go to our website, IVIIPO.org, which you should, and we'll visit there in just a second, uh, you're going to see that we have a lot of issues. And I don't mean just, you know, mental, although that's true too. But we have a lot of issues that we focus on our advocacy. Everything, women's rights, education, labor, civil rights, environment, you name it, we've got positions on it. 
and we have reasons behind them. It's not just a, no, we feel like it. It's we've thought this through and here's why we feel the way we feel. Now in terms of the, the core aspect, although you know we have different areas, environment and uh, women's choice and all kinds of things, they all kind of come back to good government. Now we can debate, fine, what qualifies good government, but the whole point is we work towards good ethical government. So not taking large corporate PAC donations, not being bought and sold, uh, not hiring relatives to work in your offices. These are some of the core things uh, that we work on. Uh, as you, if you read through this, you can see the double dipping you know, for pensions. Um, and of course we worked on things like the Open Meetings Act, strengthening FOIA, um, so we could actually have access to records that are public documents that previously the government could tell you, no, you don't get those. Uh, now I'm not gonna go through all these slides one by one because this is a lot of material. Uh, um, I'm gonna ask Charlie to go ahead and, and kind of put this into the chat as a file or I can afterwards as well. Uh, we don't currently have, but have done in the past, uh, reviewed all of the uh, General Assembly uh, folks and their voting records, as well as the Alderman in the city of Chicago, and create uh, best voting records. Um, and then at our annual dinner, the Independence Day dinner, we present a various awards, Legal Eagle, Leon Dupre, uh, young leader, uh, the Barack Obama Young Leadership, the Harold Washington Award, to recognize folks who have been done outstanding work in those areas in the past year yeah. and sometimes in more than the past year because you know much like the oscar sometimes more than one person really does deserve it so we, we keep up with that here's a photo from quite a few years ago from the independence day dinner as you can tell from <clears throat> some of the people who were there it's been some time and of course, here's some of the folks who have been guest speakers at that Independence Day dinner uh, over the years, including folks like Sid Yates, Jacob Javits, Richard J. Daly. We do occasionally put out action bulletins to get keep folks informed. And one of the things we always do, and we're doing uh, this December 13th is the current date, I believe, uh, a meet the candidates event, whether it's for the municipals here in Chicago and Cook County, or it is for the general elections, we always, always, always do meet the candidates. Um, because what better way to like get folks to meet them than to put them all into a room and say, hey, let's go. And folks show up and they meet, meet their, you know, the candidates for the various offices, shake their hands and sometimes come away saying, yeah, they've got my vote. And sometimes saying, oh boy, no, oh, that person, no, no, no. So, but it's a good way to meet them and to get a sense of that. Uh, we also do trainings, how to get you know, a campaign going, how to run a campaign. Um, uh, we have various committees, including like National Affairs, run by this very, very interesting person named uh, Charlie Paydock, who I don't know if anyone's you know, familiar with him at all, but... Uh, and then we also do uh, the Political Action Committee, which will meet and determine things uh, this, this year, we're meeting in a, in a few days uh, to determine what the questionnaires will be. Because our endorsement process is we send out questionnaires to everyone like so many other uh, organizations do. Candidates answer those questionnaires, send it back to us. Then we interview the candidates based on those questionnaires. And from that, we then go ahead and uh, issue endorsements. And this is, of course, the steps here that we're talking about, the questionnaire, the interview, committee recommendation, and then the board approval. We also issued judicial recommendations. Usually, um, this year for this November election, we actually, we have an endorsement in the judicial races, um, but we do not have the uh, uh, recommendations for retention or not, um, which apparently a lot of organizations haven't done that this year. I'm not entirely sure, but we all kind of decided, decided not to do it at the same time, so. Uh, and of course, we are a member-driven organization. So whereas a lot of other organizations, uh, um, you know, you can be a member, cool. It's, the, it's that inner board that makes decisions. 
for IVI, one of the things that sets us apart is our membership is what votes on our endorsements. So you sign up, you get, you know, pay your, pay your annual fee, you're a member, and now you get to go to endorsement sessions, interview the candidates, vote on them, whether or not they get endorsements. Um, you get access to all kinds of goodies like yours truly. And then of course the state board of directors, which is the core group of folks, the organization who kind of make stuff happen like the Independence Day dinner, like the interviews, uh, like the questionnaires, like the meet the candidates, like the other events. That's the board is one that really put that on. And as it happens, we actually endorsed a Green Party candidate, Tennille Jackson, who uh, last I checked is on this call right now. So kudos, snaps. And then of course, we have our endorsements for the November 8th election, which will also be on our, it's actually will be, they are on our website right now. You can go to iviipo.org and look at who we've endorsed. Now we only endorse folks who applied for the endorsement. So there are some races that you will see there's no one there. That's because they didn't apply or someone who applied, we said, nope, we're not endorsing that person. So here's the first set of folks that we endorsed, Congress and State Senate. And again, these will all be on our, our website. If you go there, it's a lot of people. So I told you, we interview everyone. I do in fact mean yes, we interview everyone. Um, we also take stances on various referenda. This year we have the workers' rights amendment statewide. We have voted to endorse that, to uh, say everyone, you should vote, vote yes on that. Uh, as well as several nonpartisan things in this village of Skokie that the Skokie Alliance for Electoral Reform has been working on. Uh, I suggest checking that out. You can actually just look them up online, Skokie Alliance for Electoral Reform. They have all the information there. They're looking for some really good uh, uh, reforms up in Skokie. Here's a list of our current board. I won't bore you with this too much. It's also on our website. And early voting is here. Early voting is here. Let's get going. Um, I want to make sure that I don't take too much time on this. So, I moved the other half here, which is the, the original question posed is how to be an informed voter. Well, first things first, go to IVIIPO.org, check out whom we've endorsed, check out why. Uh, yeah, we have to, to self-promote, I mean, come on, that's what we have to do. Uh, otherwise, here's a couple of ideas. Ballotpedia.org. Ballotpedia.org is a great resource. It is nonpartisan. It doesn't give you all kinds of, you know, endorsements. If you go, I don't even know who's on the ballot this year, Ballotpedia will show you. Actually, I'm going to pull up. Share screen. There we go. So we go to Ballotpedia. This is what it looks like. It has some news. You can look up your sample ballot here. If you want to go to, you can go to a different uh, district here and say, hey, this is my district, Illinois House of Representatives District 53. Who's running? Oh, look, it's Mark Walker, who's the incumbent. And it can show me the district. Oh, look, that's neat. And hey, look, here's the two different candidates. Okay, I know Mark Walker, cool. Who's this Jack Rett guy? Click on him, poof. It brings you his stuff. You can click on the campaign website, Facebook, Twitter, etc. It's very, very helpful. Uh, other options include the League One Voters. Uh, they, have, they have a whole election guide that I thought I had pulled up on my computer and apparently I don't. So I'm gonna just move on from that. Uh, but it's called IllinoisVoterGuide.org. Uh, check that out. Uh, I would recommend not going to the State Board of Elections website, the Illinois State Board of Elections. 
Um, not, not because there's anything wrong with it, except that it's awful. Um, and I'll, let me show you what I mean. So this is elections.il.gov. It's, it's not great, but if you down, go down here to click on Illinois Voter Guide, it gets so much worse. Yeah. And if you go search by elected office, and it decides to ever load. If you choose things like US Senator, great. Oh, yep, yeah, you have to switch it again. Okay, click that again. And now there's literally nothing here. So I cannot recommend going to the State Board of Elections website. It's just not great. Uh, what I can suggest is going to things like the Chicago Board of Elections. Because from here, you can choose Sample ballots right there on the front. Cool. Enter your address, hit search, and it'll actually give you a PDF like this that has that has your sample ballot. And that way you can see who's on there. Maybe you know the people, maybe you don't. Uh, the other one is the Cook County Board of Elections. If you live in Cook County, but outside the city of Chicago, this is for you. CookCountyClerkIL.gov, that's gonna mess people up. CookCountyClerkIL.gov. Go for elections, your voter information, and same idea, you submit you know, your house number, street name, zip code, et cetera, and what's on my upcoming ballot and it'll give you a sample ballot right there. Those are much better than the State Board of Elections. I don't know why they can't keep up, but they don't. All right. Now that's simply to find out who's on the ballot, literally just who's running. Uh, how do you know who you wanna vote for? Well, you wanna know where they stand so you know do I want to vote for that person? Places to look. One, the person's website. You've got their name, Google them. Look up their website. Chances are they have issues listed on their website. And if they don't, email them. They almost certainly have a way to contact the campaign. They want people to, to contact so they can earn your vote. Email them and say, hey, I didn't see where you stand on XYZ. Can you tell me? Um, you can attend candidate forums. A lot of places, including IVI, put on candidate forums. There's uh, IVI, League of Voters, uh, newspapers will do it, uh, ward committee people will do it, um, community organizations will do it. They'll put on uh, candidate forums. Show up, just go to it and hear what they have to say. And sometimes you'll be like, eh, that wasn't very informative. And sometimes you'll be like, oh, wow, I know not to vote for that guy. He's a crazy person. We're not going to vote for him. Um, if you're still like, eh, I don't know, you know, I, I like them. They've all sounded kind of competent. Cool. Well, next move on to issue organization endorsements. So if you are an environmental person, great. Who does the Sierra Club endorse? If uh, um, women's choice is, is your thing, great. Who did personal pack endorse? Um, if you are, you know, super pro gun, great. Who did the NRA endorse? Uh, <laughs> we're getting a couple of shaking heads there. Uh, if you're in favor of good government, as you should be, who did the IVI endorse? These are the organizations that drill down on issues and you see who actually got the support of organizations that you trust because that's what they focus on. Um, you know, if you're like, well, I really like this person. Ooh, but he's super into like drilling for oil left and right and the Sierra Club tells you not to. Ooh, great, then, that, then they're not your candidate. You know, it's easy to go ahead and eliminate options there. Uh, other types of endorsements that you can look for is other elected officials. Oh, hey man, I really love my, my congressperson. They're, they're great, they're wonderful, they're brilliant. They're always on top of their game. Who did they endorse in this race? Who else is backing them? Because chances are good that elected official doesn't want a moron, doesn't want someone who's corrupt, doesn't want someone, you know, who's gonna be causing a hard time as their, as their colleague, as a fellow elected official. 
So they're going to go ahead and do their own research and they're going to make their endorsements. And if you trust that person, same way as you would trust, you know, an organization, that's a, a base for you to go ahead and say, great, that person's got my vote. Um, now, much harder ones. Those are all, you know, legislative and statewide and executive and things like that. The big one that everyone fears, judicial. Judges, judges, judges. No one knows a thing about judges, but they're incredibly important. The way to, oh, hang on one second. The way to figure that out, bar associations. Bar associations are organizations of lawyers who practice in front of judges who can then say, yeah, that judge, mm -mm. oh, that candidate for judge, nope. I would never vote for them because, you know, they were an untrustworthy colleague. They were um, always late getting, getting that discovery done. They were always you know, rude to opposing counsel. Bar associations are the ones who compile that and and say yeah this person is highly qualified not qualified they're recommended they're not recommended etc uh, and let me tell you there is and as a fellow lawyer i can tell you yeah you get to know your opposing counsel really well you get to know judges really well um there is no shortage of bar associations off the top of my head uh the hellenic for, for Greek, uh, Decalogue, Jewish lawyers, uh, the Cook County Bar Association is, is uh, African-American lawyers, uh, Illinois State Bar Association, the Chicago Bar Association, uh, LAGBAC, the Lesbian and Gay Bar Association, uh, the Puerto Rican Bar Association. Again, th there, is, there is no shortage of bar associations. Uh, so look up. Apologies for the background noise. There are folks upstairs. I'm doing my best to talk over them. I'll scoot a little forward, closer to the microphone. Uh, another place, if you're in Cook County, a good place to look is called injusticewatch.org. Uh, they, let me go ahead and share this with you. Share. Uh, injusticewatch.org has a whole election guide. And this is just straight up injusticewatch.org, 2022 Cook County Judicial Election Guide. And they, they are a lot of the ones who go through and say, 61 judges for retention, they gotta have 60% yes. And they will say former prosecutors, past controversies, negative ratings, former public defender, notable reversals, highly qualified ratings. And you simply go through and say, hey, who's been recommended? Who has past controversies? Oh, Timothy Evans. Highly recommended, but past controversies. Uh, Charles Burns, been over, notable overturned, uh, past controversies, and a former prosecutor. And you can go into further info on that and read up on them. Unfortunately, there is very little way to get around having to do a little bit of work. But thankfully, we have the total sum of human knowledge at our fingertips most of the time. When in doubt, if you cannot figure out anything else, if no one else has come up with anything, Google it. Type into Google. If you type in someone's name and the first thing that comes up is a headline, you know, so-and-so caught in scandal, that's a problem. You know, um, if you're a partisan, if you're like, hey, you know what? I go with whoever the Democrats go with. Great, look up who the Democrats endorsed. They have a slate. If you are, for example, if your phone number has been gotten by some uh, list, then you end up being able to say, oh, hey, the Cook County Dems have texted me their endorsement list. I didn't ask for that, but they did it anyway. Um, and finally, the, the last one I can say is, there are crazy people like myself, who if you go, hey, who am I voting for this year? I don't know anyone. We'll go look it up for you. Find yourself a friend who's really into this. And if you go, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? You will have a report you know, on your desk by tomorrow morning saying, here's why you should or shouldn't vote for so-and-so. Um, we exist 
we're valuable, just ask us. We're happy to do it. So uh, rather than continuing on for, for much longer, I'm going to go ahead and actually stop there and say that, yes, it requires a little bit of work, but we have more access information now than we've ever had before. We just have to look for it to know who to vote for and to know how to be informed about those voters, about those uh, the candidates. So thank you for that. And then I'm happy to take questions. Okay, uh, we're uh, on to question time. Um, Jim, there's been a lot of publications coming out recently, like supposedly as newspaper deals. Um, for example, we have one that's circulating locally in McHenry County and it's a Republican rag called the McHenry Times. Let me see if I can find its website here real quick, uh, just to uh, show the audience here what's going on. What it, what it is, it's a Republican, um, a Republican sheet that's uh, going on. Let me get this up here real quick. I was looking at something else. It's called the MCH, McHenrytimes.com. And it's uh, basically a Republican um, rag sheet that I was sending out in a printed form to everybody in here. And they have been doing it. What are your thoughts on this? Or should the Democrats be doing something like this too as well, trying to... Uh, influence the voters because a lot of people still think that this is a legit publication and not just a mailer to uh to the uh people around can you kind of get your thoughts on this sure so uh in the in the city of chicago it was called this uh, chicago city wire i got them um to call them rags is an insult to rags um they are pure propaganda there is no news in there um, it is all opinion pieces. It is all misinformation. It is all just, I have nothing nice to say about them, but they're printed on newspaper paper. And we having consumed newspapers for the past, I don't know, 400 years on this kind of paper, uh, look at that with some kind of a, an authority, or oh, it must be some kind of reputable thing. It's not. Um, they actually did a study, a uh, Dan Proft, um, is the one who's actually funding and running that whole thing. Um, he was working with the parent company for the Daily Herald that when Pritzker called him out on it, then switched to a different company. Um, but yes, they're, they're intentionally printing propaganda on newspaper to make it sound legit. It's a thousand percent not. And the trick is that you know, the, the danger of free speech is we really can't stop them from doing it. We just have to make sure that voters know that's propaganda, not news. Well, how come the Democratic Party isn't using the same tactics then? There are actually Democratic organizations that are doing that, but they do not have the um, tens of millions of dollars of funding that these Republican mega donors have poured into this, uh, to this effort. So they are doing it, but much smaller scale. Okay, Norma, you got a Ooh. question? Yes, sure. I do. I think that the um, the lies and propaganda that is going on in advertising and uh, you know this quote free speech is undermining our democracy terribly, and I'm wondering what we can do to um, start getting people prosecuted for perjury or I'm um, not perjury slander or the other one <laughs> when they put it in writing <laughs> defamation well libel is what you're thinking libel libel and slander i think that if we prosecuted people for political libel and slander um or even for just lying themselves about themselves who's checking up we need a we need a a, a whole department that just does that and prosecutes people when they tell lies because it's undermining our democracy. Is there anything we can do that you, I mean, you're doing your part with IVI and I use IVI for recommendations and stuff, but I'd like to see that develop where there's more prosecution for lies and how we can get that going. So the, the I, I, love to, I would love to see it. I really, really would. The trick is that um, what they basically get to say is, well, this is just opinion. And my opinion isn't slander. I think 
that when the Safety Act goes, you know, into effect and we get rid of cash bail, it'll destroy America and Illinois will burn to the ground. I didn't say it. What I said, I think, therefore, it's an opinion. Um, and so it's not slander, it's not libel, it's not defamation, it's my opinion of what's going to happen. Okay, so I made it sound like Pritzker has horns on his head and is personally going to let everyone out of jail, etc. But it's just an opinion. It's not, I'm not saying he is the devil. So that's, yeah, I, I understand the frustration with that very, very well. Um, I mean, you have to have, um, you know, I remember um, Bruce Rauner, who was running for governor. Um, he had a commercial saying that uh, Pat Quinn raised our taxes by 66%. Our taxes went from 3% to 5%. So mathematically and statistics, you could argue it went up by 66% of the you know three um but it was it's still you know a lie kind of but there's really no accountability for politicians or political speech because we're so afraid of uh, of stifling political speech so i i fully agree with you on the, on the frustration there and not everybody is is researching like we are or cares um thank you for being here for and in uh, and uh, giving us more options for doing our research for us who's and we, if we had more people doing it it would be better <laughs> you know us people who aren't doing the research we're researching through you rather than doing our own research yeah <laughs> so, go ahead i'm sorry as a corollary uh, it's been around since the founding of our country these yeah. partisan rags so, you know, maybe I'll show it up at the rebuttal part. Okay, we have Ernie, we have Charles, and then we have Dan and Alana. Ernie, uh, you're next with your question, so go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry I missed most of the presentation because I just got here, but I something I caught at the very tail end here, I have a remark to make. Somebody asked, okay, if we know that the, the uh, Republicans are doing something that's shady, why aren't we doing it? OK, well, my attitude is because they're doing something shady or unethical. That doesn't mean that we should be doing it. That's just 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 a short remark there. Uh, I know that may be a bit naive. Uh, and I've been through some learning a little bit about the political process and how how, uh, you know, dirty tricks work. But uh, nonetheless, I don't think we should be pulling dirty tricks just because they are. And that's, and that's uh, I'll say that's one of the ongoing conversations that comes up routinely uh, in, in my world is, well, they're gerrymandering, so shouldn't we to like counterbalance that? Well, they're kicking folks off the rolls, so shouldn't we? Well, you know, it's like, and the question is, do you use the same unethical tools or do you take the high road and say democracy is more important? Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the counterbalance is, but if we don't do this, if we don't counterbalance their, their efforts, well, then they'll simply take over because they don't care. They'll take over and then we won't have a voice at all. So it's an ongoing debate, but there's no, there's no end answer to it yet. But don't you see, the, don't you see the same type of thing with the politic negative political ads? Oh, absolutely. And, and negative advertising, has has consistently been shown to do one thing and one thing only suppress the vote and that frankly i think that's abhorrent we should be encouraging everyone to vote we should honestly i think australia has it right with mandatory voting i don't care if you draw you know show up and draw a wiener on the ballot and turn it in show up to vote um you know I, i'd love to see that happen frankly in america like they have in australia right okay charlie you're next Yes, uh, Mr. Garfield, I hear over and over again from the lefties are bemoaning the fact that there's corporate financial influence on candidates and campaigns. However, in order to put together a viable campaign, it's going to cost money. You need a campaign manager, you need literature, you need conceivably airtime. Where is the balance point in this or resolution 
the two conflicting uh, values here. How do you compete against the campaign which has a dude in financial uh, means when you are virtually without any whatsoever? That's all, thank you. So as uh, Steve just put in the chat, the ultimate answer is public financing of campaigns. Because at the end of the day, um, the donations, whether it be from an individual or corporation, which are not people in reality, um, it's essentially legalized bribery. You know, you have to go out and ask people for money because you need the money to pay for mailers and pay for airtime, pay for staff, as you said. So if you can't give me money, why am I wasting my time with you? Oh, that guy can raise me, can give me a check for 2000 and his buddies can all give me a check for 2000, et cetera. Guess what? I'm going to pay attention to what he wants because he's getting me all the money that I need to run the campaign. It becomes legalized bribery really fast. So how do you balance that? You stop it entirely. You say, no, we're going to do public financing of campaigns. Um, we did see, um, starting actually really, really with Howard Dean, uh, was the start of the internet fundraising. Um, and the more people lower dollar equals more money overall, um, which now both parties, although the Democrats, I think are a little better at that. Um, both, sorry, major parties. We're not, I'm not here to disparage anybody. Um, you know, have gotten much better at. You people like AOC, who doesn't do big dollar donations from megacorps. She simply puts out stuff on Facebook and says, hey, I need some help. And people give 20 bucks, 30 bucks. But it's a million people giving 20 bucks, 30 bucks, and suddenly raise a lot of money. Um, and that kind of, I want to say crowdfunding, crowdsourcing kind of thing. Um, it's really hard to do, but it can work to counterbalance. The trick is you're still asking people for money rather than having public financing of campaigns. Okay, um, Dan and Ileana, you're also next with a question, so please go ahead. Okay, the IVI Garfield, do they support millionaires like uh, Caruso in LA, who's given 70 million for the mayor position, or uh, J.B. Plitzker, who's given, what, 140 million? I mean, is that okay to the IVI? So IVI is more, well, we are concerned about that, don't get me wrong. We're more concerned with, are you right for the job? Um, if you say, yes, I'll take corporate PAC money, that's a problem. Um, you know, uh, in this case, frankly, this year, uh, neither of the gubernatorial candidates applied for our endorsement, so neither one got it. Um, but uh, if, if there wasn't money in politics, I heard it from a, a political campaign manager. They said that there would be people shooting each other on the street. Do you think that's true? <laughs> It's happening now. If there wasn't money in politics, people would be shooting each other on the street. Well, for politics, politicians would be killing each other. <laughs> oh. I mean, I've heard of worse plans. Um, I mean, you know, uh, can you imagine? We, we could put pay-per-view on and have, you know, uh, uh, have Mitch McConnell versus uh, Dick Durbin, you know. Yeah. One, yeah. Yeah. Put that pay per view, pay off the debt real fast, you know. Um, yeah, right. But uh, you know, part of what gets me with with political fundraising and political spending, uh, they've estimated this year that's going to be nine billion dollars in political advertising this year in in this election. Nine billion dollars. And the part that hurts me the most about that is that we're still going to be looking at about twenty to twenty five percent turnout. You know, we spend nine uh, yeah. billion. Yeah. We spend billion yeah. right. in small Thanks. countries, and people don't even show up to vote. So, um, all right, yeah. I mean, you know, if you if you want to look at a, a slug out, look at the uh, campaign in Brazil between the, the between uh, Lulu da Silva and uh, Bolsonaro. That's another one. What happens when you get a little bit of uncontrolled money? Okay, I have a question. Okay, Lana, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. Uh, Garfield? Yeah, Garfield. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Keep in mind, English is my third language. Uh, I speak Russian. So yeah, I never speak English before. I try to express myself uh, uh, as best I can in English. Okay, thank you. So my question is, I will not mention district, but why? Why those politicians, corrupt politicians, Democrats, so far, I'm sorry, Democrats, because, of the, you know, like, it, it, I so far met, like, Democrat politicians. Thanks so much, I don't deal with them. But in our district, uh, Democrats, politicians as well. Let's say Alderman, okay? I will not mention name. But they never help people never like with simple question people vote for them they scream to vote for them okay blah 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 campaign blah, blah. but they never help to people it's not only my opinion mr Darfield, you know and it's like hurt because i give you a small example if i may if i may because i don't want to do the battle a very small example um in our beautiful neighborhood okay so many streets need to have like stop sign so they refer to the city okay but no you know i was attended a couple of meetings and people had only not this issue they're supposed to put stop sign because they don't care about kids school kids school buses okay they don't care so make story brief they put like little small like a paper sign okay it, it, it's ridiculous disgusting and people went to the office people requested okay they never ever simple stuff like this they never pay attention and many 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 people talk about water in our neighborhood okay it's question also okay my question is it's possibility People can, you know, lobbying more. So those eldermen, I'm not talking about senators. Senators very nice, but uh, eldermen in this, maybe they can help people sometimes. What they need in writing request, what they need to help really people. They scream for vote for them. No way. I'm not vote for them, especially in this. No way. No. We have a question. Please. Okay, so this was my question: What people can do to? you know, remind them people was work for them to, to help people, it, 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 like simple needs. That's why people work for them. Thank you so much. Like your opinion, just your opinion. Thank you so much for your story. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I actually, in my in my day job right now, I actually work for a state senator um, in her district office. Which uh, one? Can you tell me? I, uh, you know, just to tell, tell public, uh, not, it's not secret. <laughs> <laughs> not really uh, Senator Feigenholz. Who, what district number? That's number six. But you know who is very good? You know who is really good? Uh, uh, Alderman, you know who? Sure. Who? Uh, Tchaikovsky, she's very good because she like more experience, very good. Please, no and, cross talk. We and, want an answer. And Mr. Durbin. Okay, okay, okay. And again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your kind sure. Jim, your, your uh, video went off. Uh, no, I'm I'm moving to somewhere I hopefully is a little bit quieter because oh, people are trying oh, to get loud of it. What people can do? My question: What people so, can do? So this gentleman will help to the mm -hmm. neighborhood. Simple request. Thank you. Sure. So so, um, a lot of what you can do is call. Uh, we have a lot of folks who call our office. Looking Please for respond. They, you know who re they refer? They refer to call uh, your family. Uh, they never uh, respond. Answer, this is yours. Thank you. No, they're not respond. They're not helping. Why are they sitting in the office? Why? I'm, I'm Why? getting there. I'm, I'm no, you know, there. it's simple. It's I'll let him finish. You know, for district aldermen and say, you know, like uh, all district, they don't help. Put it off, Tim. Thank Put you. It off. No, no, let I, him let okay, him I done this question. Thank you. I will listen. Thank you. So, one of the biggest problems that we actually face in our office is that people don't know which level of government does what. People routinely call our office asking for things that are city services um, or are federal. So people call our office in the state to ask about their passport. 
we don't touch passports. That's a federal thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a question of some, you know, stop signs. That's your alderman. That's not, you know, that's they, right. Right. How to get them to do it? Well, that, you know, it, it part of it depends upon calling, making sure they know it's an issue, and then calling again, and then mm -hmm. calling again. Uh, <laughs> the old the old phrase of a squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's not wrong because if you're, I'll say it this way: if you're enough of a pest, they'll get the job done to stop having to get you to call them. Mm -hmm. So going to the community meetings and causing an issue, well, not causing an issue, but like raising the issue. Mm -hmm. um, calling the office on a regular basis. Hey, I know we talked about the stop sign last week. Any progress? No. Okay. You know, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Let me know what's going on. <laughs> you know, be, yeah, a, if, be if, a pest and they will want you to like go away yeah. by getting the issue resolved. But then it's already more than five months. Excuse me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All sure. Right. Again, I cannot. What I, what I can tell you is sometimes the person doesn't do their job, and that's when you should start voting for somebody else. That's when you should start, you know, saying, "Hey, who can vote against this guy and actually do their job?" That's what that's what elections for, you know, is precisely <laughs> that. Then why they sit and and get so Thank you. Anna. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Anna, thank you. But, Jim, you want to finish off the real quick? That, that was really it was just you know make sure that you are in contact with the office um call them over and over and over again show up at community events you know uh yeah, it's called it's called humiliation it's called humiliation it's called humiliation frustrated with them so they don't want to walk Lana, let him finish. And, and if, okay, go ahead, Jim, finish. And, if the, and if this is the end, you know, if the elected official doesn't want to do their job, which is which is to serve you, then, you know, it's time to start campaigning for a different person to be that job. That's all there is to it. Okay, uh, thank you. Charlie, you're next, go ahead. Charlie, <laughs> next, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Garfield, I recently got reassigned to another precinct. And I was told informally that. Uh oh, did he freeze? Yeah, he has some trouble sometimes with his internet. Uh -oh. um, I don't know what happened, but uh, he'll come back. I okay. don't know what's what's going on. All right, who else has a question while we're waiting? Kelvin, Steve, anybody? Uh. Well, anyway, um. Jim, a little before Charlie comes back, what a little bit more about your background and why you're doing what you're doing now, especially with your volunteer work with the uh, organization you're with. Sure. Um, so, so I have I worked in politics for several years, um, campaigning mostly. Uh, went back to law school, lawyer, um, and then uh, worked in private practice for a while. Now I work. Uh, in a state office, and I'm looking for a new position somewhere uh, that that hopefully will uh, hopefully will will you know pay better. Frankly, because um, your your civil servants that you think are all you know making big bucks and have tons of pensions, <laughs> people who Come were on. there who were there a while ago, they had fantastic pensions and pretty good salaries. Today, not so much. Um, because the pensions were such a huge issue. So why, you know, why do I do what I do? Every step of the way, masochism. All, all of it's masochism. So um, that's, that's what I'll tell you. And now why do I do IVI? Because it's an organization that, uh, it's one of the few organizations where their primary issue is good government. And I think in Chicago and Cook County especially, we've been in desperate need of that for, for a long time, an organization that promotes that specific issue. Okay, all right, Charlie, I know we had some internet problems, so go next. Oh, but, once again, uh, Ms. Feigenholz, by the way, I mentioned, uh, has spoken before the college complexes, but I was recently reassigned to a new precinct and I was informed informally that they've reduced the number of precincts by 50%. Is there an eff effort to establish like one centralized mega voting center for each ward that 
you will have to go to regardless of its proximity to your place of residence? So uh, the, the reduction in precincts is largely because um, we frankly, and I, I know this because we have discussed it in the office, Cook County is very short on election judges, like very short on election judges and short on locations that are willing to do it. Because a lot of places that used to do it post COVID won't, aren't willing. So we've had to consolidate a lot of polling places. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons that they've done all of that. Um, for early voting, actually right now, there is one location per ward that you go to. Now, the beautiful thing is, you can go to any of those locations and hand over your ID to be like, here's my address. And they'll pull up your ballot on the electronic voting machine. And you can just vote at any of those 50 locations for early vote. On election day, you'd still have to go to your, your local precinct. Um, I don't know of an effort to make election day uh, central unified one per ward thing. Um, I seriously doubt that would be, I don't say not feasible, but I think you'd find all kinds of legal challenges to that, um, that probably would in fact be sustained. So uh, I'm not aware of any of any efforts to make that happen for election day, but for early vote, that's what we have right now. And it seems to be working pretty well. Okay, um, uh, who's got the next question? Nobody, uh, we, we got nobody asking, so uh, got, go ahead, go. Just, just, just to answer one of the questions uh, about getting money out of uh, political finance in a minute. On this side of the pond, we look at it, like nine billion on, 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 on uh, electoral advertising. Imagine how many hospitals you can build with that, you know? Um, what happens in Britain is, is there is a certain cap on spending that either party can do. But also, depending on the popularity of the party, depending on how much they raise them, they, 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 um, they got in the previous election. Um, everybody's entitled to a party political broadcast, which is mandatory broadcast on all the terrestrial channels. Um, I mean, they're pretty much dieting, but they're not, they're not like American adverts with like 30 seconds long. These are proper five minutes long um, we were put in force our, our, our policies, etc. You know, um, so <laughs> you, it is possible to take the take the money out out, out of the big money out of politics like that. You know, about but I like certainly, if not in politics, but certainly out of the campaigning, um, to not make it so eminently bribable. But you know, it's you, it's it's one of those. It's it's like the, the, the joke about the American asking uh, directions in Ireland. He says, can you tell me how to get to Cork? He says, well, if I were you, I wouldn't stop starting from here. You know, you, you are in a situation where big money is financing politics, and you're never going to change that because big money is following financing politics. You've let, you've let, you've let that, that in, and it's, not, it's never going to change. Part of the problem is that uh, you'd have to, and this is, it's a beautiful contradiction. Uh, you have to have people who are really good at fundraising, who can do that, who use that to get elected, who then vote to get rid of their advantage of fundraising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really it's hard to ask to do, yeah. you know. It's, um, take, it, it's, it's taking to vote for an early Thanksgiving, it's like, come on, you know. But again, you know, it's one of those, um, it frankly needs to be done and it can, this is the, the only beauty of, of the US system, federalist, federal system, is that that can be done on a state-by-state -state basis because in the constitution, states determine the method of elections. Mm -hmm. So Illinois could say elections in Illinois are publicly funded and no campaign contributions, period. Yes, but the federal court has said that the, that the corporation has exactly the same rights as an individual when it comes to free speech. Mm -hmm. And if a corporation wants to set up a pack to favor one particular candidate and put several million pound dollars into, into that pack, there's nothing that the state can do to, to stop them because the Supreme Court has said that, say, Coca Cola, for example, 
mm -hmm. confront, confront both, you know, uh, one particular candidate, uh, you know, for, to, to the tune of $30 million. Well, there's nothing that the states can do to stop them. Correct. Correct. Until the Supreme Court changes that or Congress passes uh, laws or a constitutional amendment to change that, yeah, we're stuck with it. I mean, in Illinois right now, um, uh, Uline, uh, da David Uline, I think it is, uh, mega billionaire, um, he has a, he's funding Dan Proft's PAC, which is People Who Play By The Rules PAC. They're the ones who then put out all of those phony newspapers and propaganda and set up dozens of websites that are all, you know, interlinking and designed to mislead people with fake information um, and presenting opinion pieces as as news. Yeah, they're they're running. I mean, that that pack has far more money than uh, Darren Bailey's gubernatorial campaign. So, I, so I, I mean, how do you, there's no way that's ever going to stop because you, you, you've opened the, you've opened the, you, you know, you've let the vampire in the room, you know what I mean? It's, I don't know of a current method that we could get rid of it shy of a constitutional amendment, and that's a very hard thing to do. So, yeah, and people you can ask to do to change the, ask to change the constitution, and the same guys will put their voice. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, Charlie, you got your hand up, so go ahead with the next question. Yes, Mr. Garfield, I've been a member of various voting watchdog groups, and we've had them here at the college, the Illinois Ballot Integrity Project and Clean Cook County. In your experience, uh, the there are many claims outstanding that the 2016 election and others were in fact stolen. Has there been any evidence of voting irregularities within the state of Illinois, to your knowledge, regarding voting recently? So uh, I'll discuss both Illinois and generally at the same time. Um, election fraud happens all the time. Voter fraud is virtually non-existent. Voter fraud is when you try to cast two ballots, when you try to cast a ballot that you're not allowed to vote. Um, that's voter fraud. You know, going in once as yourself and once, you know, with a mustache on and saying you're, that you're your cousin. That's voter fraud. And that's what people make a huge hype about. It doesn't happen. They did a study uh, two, three years ago, I think it was. And out of a billion ballots, there were, I think, nine irregularities, of which they think three were actual intentional voter fraud. This is, of course, pre-2020, so we're not discussing that one. But, you know, out of a billion ballots cast nine irregularities, statistically, voter fraud doesn't happen. Election fraud, however, happens all the time, disenfranchising people, throwing them off the rolls and making them uh, re-register to vote. Uh, getting rid of someone's registration and then not allowing same day registrations that, oops, sorry, we knocked you off the rolls because you didn't vote last time. And so now you can't vote because you weren't re-registered when you didn't even know you were supposed to be registered. That happens a lot in this country and it's meant to suppress the vote. Um, what about, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. What about um, of the allegations made in that book, uh, 2000 Mules by Dinesh D'Souza where he, talks about people uh, registering to vote, but then a lot of the immigrants are, are, are people who are um, not uh, qualified. Oh, we'll just fill this out for you. And a mule takes it to a drop box. And of course, the coordinated aspects of trying to get absentee voting going, that kind of thing. Are you familiar with uh, D'Souza's work and uh, what is your commentary? So, um... Dinesh D'Souza has as much validity to most of what he says as those fake newspapers uh, that are being put out by Dan Proft. Um, he's a propagandist and an inciter who makes money off of riling people up. Um, so I put very little stock in what he says. Could you, in theory, get a whole bunch of people together and help fill out their ballots for them and send it in? Absolutely. 
Could they get those ballots if they're illegal aliens? No, because they won't be on the voter rolls. They won't be able to cast a ballot. They won't get a ballot. Um, you know, it's the same notion of the guy who went to the polling place, you know, in three different disguises, you know, and makes up fake names. Even in the days of the, of the you know, paper poll book they had to flip through, which I did as a poll judge, um, you know, the name's not going to be there. They're not going to be able to vote because their name's not there. So it's frankly a non-issue. Um, we have two steps, uh, Oregon and Utah are both entirely vote by mail states. And there's been simply no reports of people filling out the ballot for you and mailing it in on your behalf and getting illegals to do it. It just, it just doesn't happen. It um, in the book, but it just doesn't happen re in real life. Actually, I gave this an old five minutes thought and just think of it this way. You're an undocumented immigrant. Just imagine for five minutes you're an undocumented immigrant, right? Because you couldn't try and vote illegally. You know, have you never driven a car that wasn't totally legal? You drive like a nut. You don't want to get pulled. You don't, you know, you think an undocumented immigrant is going to walk into an office? Right. And, 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 you know, and try, and try, and try and his and try and way, what for what? To vote? They're too, they're too busy making enough money and send some home to their folks. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, like this, you know, folks who are undocumented uh, and, and here are trying to keep as low profile as possible. Um, they're not, statistically, they're not the ones going out committing crimes, despite what some politicians have claimed in recent debates. Um, they're not the ones who are out doing all kinds of, you know, uh, carjackings and stuff. Uh, there are some who are used by cartels as drug mules to cross the border, but they themselves are not, in fact, drug users or drug, you know, dealers. They were told by the cartel, you're going to take this across the border for us or we'll shoot you. Um, I know that because I've met people who that's what happened. Um, and they took the drugs across because the guy that they're with got shot for saying no. So, yeah, these are folks who are trying to just survive here. They have no interest in, in you know, causing a ruckus. They're not going to try to vote illegally. Mm -mm. So, okay. Um, who else has a question? Bob, I know you're there. Do you want to ask anything real quick, Mr. Matter, or who else? Anybody else? No. Uh, <clears throat> oh, let's see. I'm I'm trying to think of something. I don't I don't really have anything. Uh, off the top of my head right now, other than to say that uh, it's more of a, you know, just, just, I just have rebuttal stuff. Okay. Well, what do you, what, um, why don't you, because I've, I've been doing a deep dive into the 2000 mules audio book and, uh, I thought for sure you'd have some questions, more questions for Jim on this thing. Well, they, well, here, the, the IBI, uh, actually endorses democratic candidates, correct? Yes. Yeah. So like that, like right off the bat, that, that how can anybody uh you know it i don't see, I, I don't know i just don't see how anybody can endorse in good conscience endorse a democrat that's that's, <laughs> that's well but but here's the thing we're a multi-partisan organization we endorse democrats we will endorse republicans we have in the past uh we'll endorse green party we'll we actually have one uh working class people's party uh in this election we endorsed for congress you know, we review everyone who applies for our endorsement to see, you know, are your values in line with our values and are you competent to, the, to do the job? You know, it's not, it's not the highest bar in the world, but a lot of people don't meet it. Um, you know, yes, we endorse Democrats. You should see how many Democrats we don't endorse. You know, that's the real key right there. So can you briefly go over the criterion of what it takes to get a candidate approved or not? So the, the four steps, as we had in the PowerPoint, which, uh, which we'll share in just a minute, um, you have to, we send out questionnaires, fill out the questionnaire, you send it in. That's standard for most organizations. We then do a candidate interview where anyone who's in the geographic region, or if it's like a statewide kind of thing, anyone in the organization comes and sits and hears the candidate, asks them questions, kind of grills them on where they stand on things. Um, the group that sees them then makes a recommendation to the board to endorse or not endorse. 
And then the board makes the final decision to, to officially endorse or not endorse. So this is on a party basis, right? The Republicans do the same thing? Right. Right. It doesn't matter which party you're from. You simply fill out the questionnaire and on the party you put Republican, Democrat, Green, et cetera. Um, you know, we don't. Who produces like the, question the questionnaire? Is, is it mm -hmm. like State Board of Elections questionnaire or who, who produces that it, which questionnaire you're talking about? So the Political Action Committee is the one that actually like creates the questionnaires, uh, figures out what questions we're going to ask, um, you know, updates that from time to time. Uh, and then if you go to our website, IVIIPO.org, you can actually click on, there's a thing at the top that says questionnaires. You can read what people filled out. We actually publish all the questionnaires that get turned into us. We put it up for people to go ahead and uh, browse through public. You know? Okay, so this is not a, not, a, not a legal requirement to run. It's a, a, a requirement to get your endorsement. Correct. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, because I'm at your website right now, and uh, you um, have everything in there from whatever. Um, how long have you been around? And uh, just a little bit more of the back. I know you probably did covered a lot of this in the uh, presentation, but how long has the IVI IPO been around? So we've been around now 78 years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually Illinois' longest running uh, good government organization. Okay. Um, and how long has Charlie been affiliated with you guys? I think 75, 76 years. He wasn't there at the very beginning, but I think he was there pretty early on, so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm one of the founders. I founded it. That's good. I'm for good government. All right. Um, thing, you know, we, we founded largely in response to the uh, notorious corruption in Chicago and Cook County, you know, uh, where basically if you wanted to get ahead anywhere in like in civic government, even just as a worker, you had to be working campaigns, you had to be knocking doors. Oh, hey, look, you knock doors for this guy. Great. You have, a, you have a city job. You never have to show up for it. You never have to do any work, get paid a city salary or a county salary or a state salary for no work. Why? You knock doors for them. That's wrong. And so our organization founded on the notion of that's wrong. And we're going to make sure everyone knows that's wrong. We're going to make sure that people get into office who will stop that. Um, you know, IVI was instrumental in the Shackman decree that has been in place for the now 50 years, give or take, um, where the federal court basically said, yeah, you can't do that. You have to actually put civil service hiring into a non, uh, nonpartisan uh, hiring agency. Uh, because otherwise, you know, it's not civil service, it's just a political service. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a very basic question. How come in McHenry County, it's $7, $8 a pack, and in Cook County, it's $18, it's 15 to $18 a pack? Uh, because the ones in Cook County are cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and you're paying for the luxury of, of buying it in Cook County. No, uh, you're, you, the Cook County actually has quite a few services that it provides. Um, in terms of, so the county is generally in charge of uh, the health and hospital systems, forestry, um, a lot of the roadways that are somewhere between city and state, frankly, um, all of the criminal justice system, um, you know, sheriff, uh, judges, etc. So because we're a larger county, we need a lot of funds to do that. And so we raise lots of taxes. I was just kind of curious because you know other places do the same you know I, I just i just i just can't find that it's like almost a hundred percent difference just because of taxes now i mean i am i know i'm a smoker i could voluntarily quit and not pay him but you know it's right now not going to happen but uh, mm -hmm. all right anyway and that's now here's the thing though they count on that these are sin taxes they count on you not being able to quit and so you'll pay 18 instead of eight Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. In taxes, um, and they've been right, and they've been largely right about that. And so, <laughs> they can do to fund uh, uh, the various services. I know when I run out or get like one or two left, I'll go to go to a gas station in Cook County and pay the penalty. I have had the unfortunate thing of where I've waited uh, an hour driving home before I grab a smoke, and uh, it's to tell you it can be 
a little torturous for me at some point. I mean, I hate I hate to admit it, but yes, I'm addicted to this stuff. Okay, Jake's got his hand up. So, quite Jake, what's your question? Hi. Uh, the, 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 just, I want to answer the previous question. It's, it's, uh, to, to, it's, it's to make it, it's to discourage people from smoking, but unfortunately that doesn't work. <laughs> instead, what, instead what happens is that people, people like are on the border of Cook County and Lake County or one of the other counties, they'll go into the, they'll drive into the other county to buy their cigarettes there. And while they're there, they'll buy other stuff. I don't know. It's just, uh. I, I don't know how that was. I don't know how that came about, but yeah, it is a, it, it is a differential. Yeah. That's for sure. I used to um, be in a black market. She was a cashier at a big building up up off of Cumberland Avenue, and it had a whole bunch of tenants in there. And she always kept a stash in a drawer of cigarettes she bought on her own, and would charge like two additional dollars over the over the uh, over the um. Indiana tax, and you can still get it cheaper there than anywhere else. And she says, I'm pocketing a little bit of this, but don't yeah. say anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I once, I, I once, I once had, I had once had an uncle who, uh, this was years ago, he's dead now. I had an uncle on my father's side who uh, worked for years for the Chicago Park District. It was a patronage job. They forced him to go out and ring doorbells every night. It was a precinct captain. Um, yeah, I think he he was a, he was a hard worker, but I, I think he did his job. Um, they, but basically, they, he was good with his hands, so they had him going around fixing, go around his different parks, fixing playground equipment and that kind of stuff. Um, now, the kind of stuff you're talking about um, is that's that's why the Hatch Act and other things came into being. Maybe I'm wrong here, but um, the, the, yeah, it's like. It's like people people were hired uh, to do political favors, and it didn't really matter whether or not they were good at the job. It was done; they were hired for political reasons. Exactly. Yeah. And for the Hatch Act, it's also yeah, that's a federal one. It says you cannot use you know federal equipment for uh, partisan political campaigning because at the end of the day. That telephone you're calling from, that's not yours. Yeah. That's the people's telephone. The people own that right. through our tax dollars. So you can't use it for partisan, which, yeah, makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, Charlie, do you mind if I go to Ernie Norman real quick and then I take you next? <laughs> yeah, I just have a quick I have a quick remark here regarding the uh, the lady who was selling cigarettes on the side. I think I got that one beat, but it goes back 50 plus years. When I was in the army, I could buy a carton of cigarettes for a dollar. I didn't smoke, but a carton for a dollar. And in the city, they were six, seven, eight dollars. And I'd take them up. Uh, I didn't do this long, but uh, took took them up to places where I worked and sold them for two or three bucks. And everybody was happy except the tax man. And I, I'm, I'm hoping the statute <laughs> of limitations is passed on that. So <laughs> well, so I'm slightly better with the not. Um... During the 1980s, Liverpool Football Club was to do, to do a pre-season tour of Europe. And all the local uh, merger one lads at once could, would actually, well, lads would join the tour and all they would have was one welfare check to get them through this whole tour of Europe. So what they used to do is they used to get that welfare check and they cash it into, into five pence pieces, which is about the same as a, as a dime, right? Uh, oh. And they cash it for five, five pence pieces because the five pence piece was exactly the same size and weight, near as it, as a German mark, right? And the German mark was worth something like about a dollar, right? So they'd, they'd cash all their, their money into uh, five pence pieces, wait, live off their, make their friend's charity until they got to Germany, then buy cigarettes from vending machines at uh, uh, 10 cents for a dollar. Uh, and then smuggle those over the, the border to Austria, where there where, where they were higher taxes as well, and sell oh. them with a premium. Okay. All right, uh, Charlie, you're next. Uh, yeah, Mr. Garfield, uh, there's a problem in the city of Chicago because people who reside in Indiana, like Bob Matter, vote Republicans into office 
and they allow open gun sales. And just like cigarettes, guys purchase guns cheaply in Indiana and then sell them in Chicago. Uh, Chicago has pretty good gun control laws because we have organizations like IVI, but has there been any thought given to establishing an independent voters of Indiana so that they would stop voting in these Republicans? Well, but here's the thing. There's nothing to say that the independent voters of Indiana wouldn't support and endorse um, Republicans. You know, it depends upon what their values are. It depends upon whether or not there are good government Republicans. Um, whether or not they get our endorsement here in Illinois, you know, that, that I can't say. Um, but as to the gun issue, what I'll tell you is, and this is, this is where law school ruins you. Uh, thanks to our federal system, I'm gonna move back to the other room because it's getting loud again. Uh, thanks to our federal system uh, and the fact that we have 51 separate, you know, uh, we, are, we are one federal system and then 50 separate little countries that all make our own rules. Um, the fact of the matter is that when it comes to interstate travel, even of goods such as, you know, guns, we really can't stop it. It's, it's unconstitutional for Illinois to say, we're gonna stop every car that comes in and search it for guns. Supreme Court's talked on that a long time ago and it talked about it multiple times. So we can have, and this is one of the problems that Illinois faces right now, we've got the strictest gun control laws in the universe. It does nothing because more than 60% of the guns in Illinois that are used in crimes come from other states. They come from Indiana, Kentucky, Wisconsin, and Mississippi. Like we've ultimately traced those. Until the federal government, the ATF, gets involved, and the Attorney General through, you know, uh, above, above them, gets involved, they can stop cars at the border. They can require background checks. They can require you know, stopping straw buyers, stuff like that in other, in other states. Those are things that the federal government can do that constitutionally Illinois can't. So until and unless we change our federal system of government um, from federalism to one unified nation, we're going to face this problem. Okay. Um, what would happen if Illinois did, for example, uh, and I'll get Bob to you in a minute, we, if we put up border control stations on the state line? They'd be challenged in court and the, the federal, federal court would say they, they are unconstitutional and that we have to take them down. And that and that anyone who was, you know, stopped might have a cause of action against Illinois. Um, and that anyone who was arrested or was charged with trafficking, those convictions would likely be tossed uh, from the federal court because the, the action that led to it was unconstitutional in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. I know it was an off-the-wall question. It's, it's, the same, it's the same law that protects... Um, Pregnant women go to get an abortion in a, in a, right. in a, in a different state. Yes. Oh, well, it, I'll, I'll say, and I, I realize we have two people who want to ask questions. I'll say that it's slightly different because one of them involves interstate commerce. They're bringing, you know, a, a, a product across state lines. The other one is the right to travel, where you cannot restrict someone's right to cross state borders basically for any reason other than that they're fleeing from like an act of pursuit kind of thing. Um, and even then, like, you're, you're already pursuing them. There's the famous Woody Guthrie song, Go Away, but it's not about that. They did it, tried it in California right. in the 30s. All right, let's go to Bob Matter next. Okay, Bob, go ahead. Okay, so um, so I'm a little bit confused now. Uh, like the what criteria is uh ibi using when like like when they select uh, a candidate if, if the candidate is pro-gun is he automatically uh you know eliminated or if he's uh pro-life or you know i'm kind of wondering like where do, where do, where do these uh you know values come from and uh and the second thing is i just want to make for for charlie and all these other people who live in illinois if you would uh, perhaps try um, sentencing your criminals uh, to jail and then keeping them there for a while, 
maybe that would lower your crime rate and you wouldn't have to keep whining about people bringing in guns from Indiana and Kentucky. So I'll, I'll address both of those things as quick as I can. I, I can't stay on the call too much longer, so I will, I will answer as many as I can. Um, as for the IVI's criteria, there is no hard and fast, if you don't agree with X, then you're out. Like there, there is none of that. Um, but IVI does have generally held beliefs. And you can see that on our website under, under issues. We have lots of things where we stand. Um, our organization generally, yes, supports uh, women's choice, supports reproductive rights. So if someone says, no, nope, I'm fully against that, well, then the majority of our, of our members are probably not gonna support that, that candidate. Um, it's not that the organization says you cannot be endorsed, just the organization supports it. Um, so there, there, but there is no hard and fast, like if you don't agree with XYZ, you can't get endorsed. Except probably things like, yes, I believe in a corrupt government and I'm gonna hire all of my family members to be you know, paid in my office. That's probably gonna guarantee that you don't get an endorsement. Um, Somebody like, a, like, like the Strogers, for instance. Yeah, Stroger or um, Berrios. Uh, Joe Berrios was the Cook County Assessor for ages. And he was notorious for hiring all of his family and you know, employing them at high paying jobs that, you know, uh, that, that they did no, no work but got paid on the county dime. That's the kind of the core thing of like, that's why we exist is to stop that. So uh, a, a litmus test is the phrase that was just put in the, in the chat. Um, as for the other half, actually, so it, uh, as to locking up our criminals, um, that actually has zero bearing on whether or not someone commits crime. And I'll tell you, there have been- Oh, systems. really? Oh, yeah. really? So if I put you behind bars and I keep you there for 10 years, how many murders are you going to commit in 10 years? No, no, that's not the question. The question is, uh, will I think that I'm going to get away with the crime in the first place? People don't commit crimes thinking they're going to get caught. They commit crimes thinking they're going to get away with it. But what they've done the studies, and I was even in the state attorney's office early in my career. The fact of the matter is, the length of the sentence does not change whether someone commits the crime because they don't think they're going to get caught. Well, I mean, well, that's a two-part story. I've got a, a criminal law case book right at the end of my bed right now sitting there that it's just out of reach and I'm too lazy to get it. But it says right in there, and I agree with this 100%, that uh, criminals do a cost-benefit analysis before they commit a crime. And the cost is is the risk of, appreh the risk of apprehension and the severity of the punishment. So, like in, uh, in, in Illinois, uh, the the risk of apprehension is fairly low for most things, and and then the severity of the punishment is practically nil. And if if you read cwbchicago.com every day, you'll see you know left and right <clears throat> these judges are letting people off the hook, five hundred dollars bail. Or there's a story today about a guy who attacked a, a fellow tenant in a building at 3400 North Lakeshore Drive, a condo. He uh, hit this, assaulted this woman with a recycling bin, hit her over the head, tried to drag her behind the stairs and, and uh, sexually assault her. Actually, she screamed and other residents <clears throat> interrupted this guy and he got caught in the lobby by the police. But um, <clears throat> the judge uh, ruled him not guilty by reason of insanity. This is a guy that lives at 3400 North Lakeshore Drive. I'm telling you, you can't be too insane and live in a high priced piece of real estate <laughs> like that. I don't think. Uh, so, so, like, what the hell? How the hell does that happen? But that's all. It's right in CWBChicago.com. You can go there right now and read the story. Right. So, uh, first things first, we've had do, the. Do the, the we've had the. Uh, do, the, the mayor. Oh. Do, do, the do the condo association a victim for it? Uh, that I don't know, but like, no, he's, he's not guilty by reason of insanity. So no, I would say they this would not be able this, to this, 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 le this legally, but the, by my understanding of the condo kind of association has a right to evict, uh, evict people for various things. I would think that, I would think that something like that would be evictable. Without I don't know. Fire. I think, I think, I think his attorney would no. be able to say, 
No, you can't do that. He should should be placed in a psychiatric facility if he's not guilty by reason of insanity. Before we go down this rabbit hole, Tony O. Jackson's got a question. So don't. So Tony, please. Oh, can I just ask a, I, I want a patient there. Can I just ask me a question to Bob? If, if putting people in jail was so successful at, at reducing crime, why isn't, why isn't America the lowest crime rate in the world? Why isn't why? Why it? You have nearly 1% of your population in jail. More than any other Western nation in the world. Yes. Uh, well, for, one thing we have, for one thing, we have we have a we have a lot of black people who are the who commit yeah, a lot of crime. We've got a lot of black people as well. Okay. No, no, you don't have no, you don't you don't have anything like we have. All right, let's let's let Tanil get her question in, please. Tanil, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I, I didn't necessarily have a question. I hope you all are able to hear me because I'm driving. I have been on um, since we started, and I just wanted to come in and thank Jim um, because I actually am a Green Party candidate that the IPI IPO endorsed. And so I wanted to come on, number one, to thank him, but also just to kind of be proof that they are different than a lot of other organizations. As a candidate, um, I've had to do a lot of different endorsement interviews. And one of the first questions that they ask, and this kind of goes back into the earlier conversation that you all had, mostly every place you go for endorsement, they ask you, how much have you raised for your campaign? And for me, I find that question to be very like offensive and unnecessary because if we are talking about, am I good for the job, then it shouldn't matter. And the fact that you're asking automatically to me insinuates that you are looking at that as basis as to whether or not you are going to um, endorse me as opposed to just whether or not I am good for the job. And, um, and so in either case, I just wanted to, because I have to hop off, but I want to tell Jim and everybody else at IBI IPO, thank you for endorsing me as a candidate and as being Green Party. We do not accept corporate donations. That is something that I stated in the interview, um, but at the same point, there were other points that I made, and it made me feel good because a lot of times people automatically count out Green Party candidates because we are not one of the major political parties, but there are some, you know, good and viable Green Party candidates. And again, I just want to thank Jim and the rest of IBI for recognizing that in me enough to um, give me the endorsement. So thank you very much for that. Okay, Tony, thank you for commenting. Yeah. Well, could you get a get a quick question? Could you tell tell us your name and what uh, office you're running for? Tanil, he's Absolutely. My name is Tanil Jackson, and I am running for MWRD commissioner um, for the two year term, and I will be number 57 on the ballot if you are in Cook County. Okay. All right. All right. What are your, what are your qualifications? What are your qualifications? That, I, he's asking. I can go. No, I heard them. I just want to make sure that this is the platform for it. But basically what the MWRD commissioners do, one of the main jobs that they do is they write policy um, to protect our water environment. And so, number one, I am an author by trade. So that's one of the things that I do. Number two, I am an environmentalist. I'm one who cares about the environment. And then um, there are many of the same qualifications that MWRD has or the values that they have that overlap with those of the Green Party, such as future focus on sustainability as well as personal and global responsibility. So these are things that I'll be able to bring to the table. And most importantly, my campaign is about being able to educate and empower. And a lot of what's going wrong with our um, MWRD uh, board right now is that they don't do a lot of interaction with the actual community. And so for me, that's one of the things that I'm looking to change is to be more interactive with the community. So I'm hoping that within two minutes that was able to address your question. Okay, I got a question for you, Tony. Have you ever visited the water reclamation, the water filtration plant and the sewage treatment plant in Stickney, Illinois? No, I have not been in Stickney, Illinois. 
There is one that's in Calumet uh, Park, and then they actually, the MWRD just had their 10th annual sustainability summit, which was um, at the Big Marsh Park here in uh, Chicago on 115th and Stony Island. So I am on the south side of Chicago. I have not been to Sydney. Yeah, because that's where they had the world's largest sewage treatment plant, and that's part of the uh, MWRD. Yes, I know. We have seven plants um, within the Cook County area, so I'm aware of all the locations. I simply was just responding to your question, which was, have I been to the specific one in Sydney? And that answer is no. But you have been to a couple of them and know the process, correct? I know about being able to clean the water and all of that stuff in terms of what the treatment plant operators do. Although, again, I will go on record to say that what the treatment plant operators do within the plants and what the actual commissioners do are different jobs. So I just want to go on record to let that reflect that as well. Okay. No, I was just curious, Daniel, because I, we've had water board candidates on before who knew absolutely nothing about water. That's why. No, and that makes sense. And a lot of things, one of the things that we tell people, because a lot of times people uh, confuse what the water reclamation district does. So we always want to make sure that everyone understands that we are not the same as a water company. So we don't deal with drinking water. We don't deal with like if there is lead in the water, that's outside the scope of what MWRD does. What we do is we treat and reclaim the water that's coming in. So storm water and wastewater, those are the waters that we deal with. So you're the one that I have one more question. Um, why why doesn't why doesn't the water reclamation district deal with drinking water? You would have to ask the water reclamation district that. I don't know. That's not historically. We have been around since eighteen. Well, the MWRD has been around since eighteen eighty nine. They have never. That has never been um, what they have done. They've always been where they have treated the water within the Chicago River, within Lake Michigan. That's what it is that they do. They don't treat the water that comes in your home. They treat the water that comes out, out of your home. So when you're flushing the toilet, taking your bath and draining the water and everything that goes out of your home, that's the water that the MWRD does. Everything else is the water company. So what goes in your home is the water company. What comes out of your home is MWRD. Would be the Chicago Water Department and it filtrations your water to go into your home then, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So anything that goes inside your home, so when you're, you're drinking water, what's coming in your faucets, what's coming through your uh, showers and all of that, that's the water company. What's going outside is MWRD. And I know that sometimes it's semi-confusing because as soon as you hear water, you automatically feel that water just means all water. But in terms of the way that the companies are set up, they are distinct um, operations. So you have one company that does with inside, one company that does or agency that does with outside. I was just kind of curious about that because, you know, you have people on the board. Is there, is there like elected positions in the water management department in Chicago? Let's move on, Tim. All right. I was just curious. Come on. It's... All right. But again, thank you all so much because I do have to hop off. But because I've been on since six, but I have something that I have to get to at eight. But thank you all so much. And again, to Mr. Garfield, thank you very much. You and IBI, IBO. You all have a great rest of your night. No thank you for so coming yeah. tonight, okay? All no right. problem. Don't forget to punch 57. Okay. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, I do actually have to leave fairly soon um, uh, okay. as well. So I do want to quickly address uh, Bob's earlier points. Okay, uh, before we, Jim, what we'll do is we'll let you make your final sure. remarks and then we'll go into rebuttals. And if you okay. want to stick around, you can. If not, that's fine too. I, I won't be able to, unfortunately, but I did put my email into the chat down there. Uh, so if anyone wants to contact me directly, you've got my contact. Okay. So go ahead with your final remarks and address what you said about Bob. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, so what, for what Bob said earlier, um, you know, uh, harsher sentences, et cetera hasn't worked. We've had the death penalty since Sumer, and it has not stopped crime from happening. Um, you know, a lot of people have for longer. We have the highest prison population, as, as Calvin was mentioning, in the world, and it hasn't stopped crime. Like, that's, that's not the solution. And what you're talking about there would be Illinois 
locking up Indianans and Wisconsinites and uh, Kentuckians for violating Illinois' laws and because we don't like the fact you have guns here. So we're going to go ahead and just lock I'm it up. Talking about the, I'm talking about the people in Illinois that, that bought those guns to use them illegally. When they get caught, if they had a you know any meaningful prison sentence, uh, they would think twice about, uh, you know, people would think twice about committing those crimes. So unlawful, I mean, you, you know, unlawful use of weapon by a felon is a class X felony uh, facing six to 30 years in prison. And they always give, years. They, they give them automatically. They give them half off their sentence in Illinois right off the bat. You get sentenced to six years. You're only doing three. And then you had to wait for your uh, hearing for two years at home on quote unquote electronic monitoring, which they count as prison time. So you end up going to jail for like doing a year for uh, basically committing a felony. It's a big joke. How about, how about let's do it. Let's bring in a real death penalty where we're actually going to kill somebody about a week after they're found guilty. And we're not going to let them drag on with, with all these, uh, you know, appeals and everything for 20, 30 years. And they die of old age before they finally get killed. Let's, well, you know, we've never tried it when putting some teeth in some, in, in the law. Cool. We can go ahead and ditch the 14th Amendment and get rid of due process and all that fun stuff. You know, we can just go ahead and just start executing people left and right. But our system of government currently doesn't allow that because we have due process rights. So you want to amend the Constitution? Go for it. You know, be my guest. We can go ahead and amend it to, uh, if we can amend it the Constitution to get uh, campaign finance for reform, I'm sure we can amend it to have, you know, automatic death penalty for every crime. So um, that's, that's, that's where I'll have to leave it. But um, By the way, uh, Mr. Garfield, I'm, yes. ci I'm citizen of Tlana, yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, who asked you your question, excuse my English. Uh, I'm citizen, that's what I just tried to say. I'm citizen uh, of this country <laughs> and uh, very honored. And thank you very much for your speech and answer my question. Thank you very oh, much. Pleasure. Thank you so much for listening and for asking thank the you. questions. It's very important to be citizen, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thing, the fact I'm that you guys are good. here listening to this, hearing us, you know, yeah, yeah. Money, it's that helping. is honestly the first step in being an informed voter. So yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you guys. Yeah. So that's what I just informed you. I'm citizen. <laughs> very Great. good. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. For thank, your time. You. thank you. And if anyone's got wants to contact me directly again, the email is in the chat below. I'm happy to keep answering questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't stand for rebuttals, but thank, thank you very much for your kindness. We'll, we'll do that now, as Jim. If you need to go, go, and we'll get into our rebuttal period. And uh, well, yeah. let's thank our speaker. Thank our speaker again. My pleasure. Thank you all. Have a great night. All right. Thanks, Jim, for coming tonight, and you're more than welcome to stick around if you want. All right. Who's got rebuttals tonight? All right. Who's got rebuttals? Charlie's got a rebuttal. Uh, who else? Steve, did you have a rebuttal? And Kelvin, you got one? No, Steve, not, not for you. Kelvin, yes. Charlie, yes. Uh, Bob, did you want to go for one? Ernie, yes. Okay. Uh, anybody else tonight? Norma, uh, Lana, Gary, Jay, is it Jake, any, any chairs? Okay. So I got uh, Charlie, I got Ernie, I got Bob, and I don't know, did I miss anybody? Okay, what I'll do is I'll give you guys each about seven minutes or so, and we'll start off with Bob, and then, or, or we'll start off with Ernie, then we'll go to Bob, and then we'll go to Charlie. Is that okay with everybody? Hey, can I go second? Yeah, yes. Uh, Bob, you want to go first real quick then? or no, Okay, I don't, I don't know if I'll punish you with seven minutes or not, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, anyway, so this IVI, well, we smoked them out. I always thought that uh, they were probably just a lefty front group. And yeah, and that's all they are. You know, they're not going to, uh, you know, they're they're going to lean, as the guy admitted, you know, they're going to they're gonna go for the, uh, the uh, pro-abortion candidates. And just and face it, you know, I mean, you know, this is not rocket scientist, ro rocket science. Uh, abortion is taking a, a life. It's taking an innocent, innocent life. And uh, that's known as murder. So, you know, you don't have to be a, a you know, rocket scientist to figure that out. Um, but yeah, they're going to go for it. And, you know, I didn't get into it with him. But 
Bob, I muted you by mistake. I apologize. I was trying to do something, and I, I think I accidentally <laughs> muted you. Sorry, okay. Bob. Right, I'm back. So where, where, where did I leave off? About, well, did most you hear me? of it came through, Bob. Oh, okay. So anyway, so the IVI is just a front group, again, for uh, the, the left. And uh, they're also, you know, they're also going to be pro- gay rights they're going to be pro gay marriage they're going to be uh pro affirming uh gender uh you know transitioning children you know into gen you know gen gen genital mutilation uh and all that that's they're going to be jamming all that down our throat you know they're going to be pro all that stuff so this is just nothing but uh uh you know another marxist front group so i would basically ignore them there is some place, there is a way you can determine, for the most part, uh, who to vote for. And you can cut out the IVI altogether and just vote for the people with the R after their name, with the Republican. <laughs> That's pretty much all you got to do. If you need any more than that, now once in a while you'll get somebody like a Romney. Yeah, but, you know, that, I don't think you have to look too hard to figure out who these, you know, rhinos are, these Republicans in name only. Yeah, but people that aren't really, you know, pro-family for, uh, uh, you know, uh, traditional family, you know, tradition that are for low inflation, uh, for not having a nuclear war with Russia, uh, for, for strong, uh, tough on crime laws. You know, we know who those people are and it's, it ain't the Democrats. Um, Democrats is just good. Is, is just. This, you know, uh, this kind of a slap together coalition of a bunch of uh, special interest groups, you know, of uh, identity groups, you know, and they can barely contain themselves from from uh, killing each other. Uh, but uh, they all have a, a unified, a common uh, unified scapegoat, the white heterosexual male. And as long as they can all gather around and, and create hate for that and talk about, oh, January 6th and, you know, a threat to our democracy and, and you know, and, uh, you know, white supremacy and oppression, you know, but as long as they can do all that, uh, they can kind of keep the uh, their members from going after each other. But, uh, you know, it turns out there's a lot, a lot of animosity between the individual groups as they're all jockeying for special favors to get uh, you know, all the little special gimmicks, uh, of like, you know, who's going to get, uh, you know, more points on their civil service exam, you know, that comes down to, well, you're going to get some, how many boxes you checked? Did you check the gay box? <clears throat> Did you check the minority box? Did you check the female box? <clears throat> Did you check the handicap box? France had to get, do away with all that crap because it starts getting too crazy. And I think that's what we're going to have to do here. Because you're going to have people that are, uh, they're going to be like, well, uh, I'm a quarter black and versus a, my competitor for a job is a quarter Hispanic. So uh, who's going to get the job? You know, which, which identity group is, uh, was oppressed more by the evil white heterosexual men? Um, and so and this is going to be for like, you know, school admissions. Like, uh, <clears throat> So anyway, like I said before, <coughs> none of this is <clears throat> none of this is rocket science. It's sort of like you're in the common sense bucket that you're for the family, uh, you know, family traditions, um, you know, law and order. You know, you're against uh, this these wide open borders that we have with with uh, with Biden. Um, you know, you're against this runaway inflation. You're against all these giveaways for certain identity groups like the Democrats trying to give away this uh, half a trillion to a trillion in student loans, you know, basically passing that off on people that did not go to college. So, you know, you see all these things that that's, that's going on on, on, on the left and uh, <coughs> it should be a pretty easy decision to make. Nobody in their right mind, nobody with a half a brain, uh, will vote Democrat uh, for anybody. A uh, good place to start. You might want to read uh, "Read American Marxism" by Mark Levin. That, that's a that's a good one uh, for you, and you'll, you'll see uh, all what's going on, how they're trying to 
break up the the family and and all that with their uh, you know <laughs> having dorming schools and having gender. We can't hear you. We can't hit by. We can't hear you. Your internet you up, Bob. Okay, you're breaking up, Bob. You still want to talk a little? Oh, drag. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a lot of people that commit very serious crimes, specifically murder. So we have a lot of murderers. You don't have a lot of murderers in, like I said, it's not it's not rockets in a lot of other countries. But we do. We have a, a, a large to commit most of the murders. If we, we would take them out of the equation, we'd be a very normal country, not really vile. But we have this problem, you know. All right, Bob, it's been close to seven minutes. Are you all finished? Uh, we can't hear you on your internet connection. I'm going to stop you at this point and uh, ask uh, Ernie to come in. So if Ar you don't. Yeah, all right. If Bob gets this thing going, give him a couple minutes at the end. Yeah, right. first of all, I want to I want to make it clear up front. I don't agree with Bob on a lot. Uh, during my short presentation here, I may say a couple things in which I do agree with him, but generally I, I, I do not. I uh, certainly don't believe that we should uh, execute people a week after conviction, although we should move the court pr process much more quickly than we do. Uh, regarding the, the talk tonight, I didn't hear more too much of it, but I know the IVI IPO, uh, probably, probably most of the candidates they endorse and support are toward the liberal end of the spectrum, but they at least make a pretense um, at, at being uh, bipartisan. And, and that's, that's where something, there's also a group in Washington called the Bo Bipartisan, I believe it's a commission or coalition. I don't know much about them, but they sound like they're at least making a sincere effort to be bipartisan. <clears throat> Problem is with our system, I don't think we should be, um, a uh, bi-party system, we should be a multi-party system. We've talked about this before in many cases. I think you have to go to a parliamentary system sure. if you're going to have multiple parties. David Ramsey Steele did bring that out once and I think uh, uh, opened my eyes. The reason that we that you tend to have only two parties in some countries is because when you have an effectively a direct election of the president, which we have, uh, you know, never mind the the uh, uh, what, what do you call it? The electoral college. We do, we directly elect the president, whereas in other countries they elect uh, prime they elect uh, members of parliament and other folks who then elect the top officials. And uh, that that uh, you know more parties I think would be better. You'd have more viewpoints uh, that would be show, well, shown and brought for, and there would be co coalitions. And it would be more like it was 30, 40, 50 years ago with even with two parties, people got things done. They didn't have a great deal of hostility and, and the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, fact that we, we were always a bimodal kind of uh, curve in terms of where people were, not too many people in the middle. Now the middle is very, very wide with very few people and people and most voters are at extremes and this is this is a problem this is the biggest problem i think that we have to solve that getting money out of politics is one of the mo most important things we can do uh you know we have as people have said the best legislature the best government that money can buy that applies to many states as well shortening campaigns would be good now kelvin uh, you're in uh, UK, right? How long yeah. are campaigns in in uh, in UK? Much... A, a, a government funded, uh, partially government funded, partially funded by the parties. Um, oh. On terrestrial there time television, there's, there's no television advertising on terrestrial television um, for for party political. Uh, instead, you get allocated uh, a five minute slot, which is shown on all channels. Okay, um, where you where you make up a, a party political broadcast. Okay, we and that is 
and that is funded by the uh, by, by the state. Well, okay. it's, it's you know, the airtime is funded by you know, it's given to you by the state. Kelvin, uh, yeah, me, yeah, give give Kelvin a few minutes to do uh, to describe uh, this there is, model. There are strict limits on how much you can spend on each constituency. I think it's one hundred eighty thousand pounds per okay. constituency. But you know? but aren't the campaigns much shorter as well? Oh yes, much much shorter. I mean, you guys, well, you guys live in a permanent election. You know, in some cases, it's years in our case, in many months. Well, uh, all right. well apart, from the, apart from the first hundred days, well, that's it, isn't it? All right. All right. I'm going to move on from there. Uh, I think term limits are a good idea. A lot of people don't like that, especially people who are in office. And also the money out of politics, they don't like because they can they control it better. Um, but uh, so, so those those are those are the main things that would possibly make democracy work. I'm not convinced that democracy uh, uh, could really work well, no matter what we do. But uh, at least it would have a better shot. Regarding crime, we have much more crime in this country, more people in prison, because of the the, the national karma, the national attitude is is much more toward uh, freedom of action, freedom of speech, etc than in most places. And also we're a land of immigrants. The people who settled this country were, were rebels and they left where they were a very comfortable situation and made very dangerous crossings of the ocean to come here. And as a result, they're, they're, they're uh, achieving people and, they're, and they're, they, they're a little bit rebellious. And that gets right on down to the, to the lowest end where people will commit crimes. Uh, uh, criminal activity and some of our our uh, most basic community building and and business building activity uh, is borderline criminal and it's rebellion a form of rebellion and and that's why we have more crimes at all levels uh, I think one of the best ways to solve it would be first of all move move the move the uh, issue along much faster than we do uh, so people, aren't sitting uh, in prison. I think this business of, of uh, no bail, I'm not sure I like that, but uh, of course the, the Republicans are making it sound like something that it isn't, like they're gonna just release everybody from prison. That of course is not true, but uh, judges still have jurisdiction in the case of violent crimes to, to not allow people out. Whereas with this current system, if they have enough money, most people can get out on, on bail. So, so that's a very serious problem. Uh, and the fact, uh, I, one way that I'm against a lot of the people I think in the group and, and agree with Bob, we should have the death penalty. I think the death penalty does have an effect. Uh, it doesn't the way we implement it. I mean, we take years and years to try people and then, event, and then usually they don't get the death penalty. We, we have very few death sentences in this country. And therefore, it will not be a deterrence. There was a, a professor I had years ago, years ago, Isaac Ehrlich, who specialized in this area uh, of motivation for crime. He was uh, written up in Newsweek and, and quoted in many national sources. And he pointed out, Bob was two thirds right. Uh, there are three factors. There's the likelihood of getting caught uh, and, and the severity of the penalty. But right in between is really the, mo the most important one that affects <coughs> the likelihood of conviction. Uh, that is a very important thing. And people don't sit down, criminals don't sit down and, you know, with a sheet of paper or a spreadsheet and calculate this stuff. They work it, they work it out kind of instinctively in their mind. But the most important issue is likelihood of conviction. If that's high, uh, then they're, they'll likely sit back. Of course, if people don't believe they're going to be caught, they don't believe that they're going to be convicted. And, and yes, the penalty does have an effect. If people do think about the penalty when they're thinking about the crime uh, a little bit, but it's it's uh, third on the list of importance and and probably not uh, not at the forefront. Well, so one thing that, about the death penalty, one thing about the death penalty is the rate of recidivism is zero. Well, yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of a, a slogan, Bob, that really, you know, it's it's cute, but it doesn't really affect it. Psy psychologists have done studies with rats and they'll put a piece of cheese down at the end of a tunnel and there'll be an electric shock and the rats will see that cheese and they'll go running for it and then they'll get shocked. And 
after one or two times, they understand that there's cheese down there, but there's also an electric shock. And they'll typically still start running toward the shock, uh, toward the cheese, and then they'll slow down and eventually stop and turn around. Uh, the point being that the benefits of taking an action, whether it be a good action or a criminal action, seems very high at a distance. But the closer you get to it, the more important the negative aspects of taking that action uh, seem to be, uh, uh, you know, we see them in our, in our mind and, and we act accordingly. And that's everything from committing the crime as to whether we should walk over and ask that girl to dance. If she's good looking, we head over there real fast and we start thinking, uh oh, what if she turns us down? That would be that would be bad for our ego. Ernie, so Ernie, we often don't do the murder it. Rate, the murder rate is not lower where you have the death penalty. Uh, I'm not sure in every Nowhere. case. Huh? Nowhere. Okay. Well, I'd, 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 like lower. See, I'd like to see the specific uh, data on nowhere. that. I think in, and uh, don't say nowhere, Charlie. That's uh, nowhere. Yeah, I will uh, say nowhere. For, for what well, I well, well, send me some data. The murder rate it. did not go down because he had a death penalty. Yeah. That's a lot of Florida, 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 Florida has a very strong death penalty. Death penalty yeah. laws. Um, is, yeah, is the murder I'm, rate I'm, lower in Florida? Well, what I'm saying, what I what I tried to say earlier in my rebuttal is that that the way we implement the death penalty, no, it it does uh, it uh, it doesn't have much of an effect. Yes, but but yeah, they, they, they know they're gonna they know they're gonna die of old age before they ever get. But that's a good they're, point. They're, they're, they're from what I remember, Illinois, uh, what I remember, Illinois uh, stopped using the death penalty because 18 of the 28 people on death row were found found to be not uh, to, to be not guilty of crime. And they could have easily been killed in that time. But you know, they did 18 of the 28 people you had on death row were found were found not were, were, were found not guilty on appeal. Now, where 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 and when was this Kelvin? Changing, how the hell can you how can you how do you can you implement state murder within a system system that is so faulty? In point of fact, well, we there are cases, but there are very few. <clears throat> Where people yeah, are, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, when you, that's when you stop using the death penalty, Illinois. With our, with our, with our modern methods, that's nearly impossible now. We, with video surveillance, with, uh, with DNA, you know that that's not going to happen. You're talking about old time, you know, eyewitness testimony and things like that. That's rare, rare to never happens. Yeah. So the one thing we know happened? is when we let a, when we let a murderer out, they murder again, and. It, once oh, yeah. you kill a murderer, yeah. he's not going to murder again. And the state won't have to yeah. keep paying to keep his ass in prison for 30 years. Yeah, but Bob, you'd have any woman that ever went to the on that death row as well. What happened? The DNA evidence is only good if there's, say, a rape before the murder. Otherwise, there, there, there are a lot of murders that take place that don't have a rape or anything before them. So yeah. how do you check DNA? It's meaningless. But but according to Bob's political point of view, every woman who goes for an abortion will be on, be on that row as well, and or any uh, any uh, any uh, any guy that gave her the money to go. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, Ernie, you have any more anything else to say? Uh, basically, I I think I'm done. Uh, you know, I'm one of those guys who can always find more to talk about. But let's uh, go on to somebody else. Uh, I know Charlie wants to rebut. I just want to do a real quick one myself, um, and it's be very fast. Um, I was just doing a little research as to our uh, everybody complaining about how our press is so, uh, um, you know, about how our press is so, uh, you know, but you know, one sided, and one side is uh, is there, right. and, you know, uh, this isn't something new in our country. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick article here. Um, it was dealing with a fake or, pro or partisan press, lessons from the founding era of our country. And it's, it's just going to be a very quick article. I'm going to thumb through it, maybe hit some of the high points. I'm going to share my screen real quick with everybody here just to make sure you can see it. Um, apparently, during Washington's time, we did have a lot of partisan press between the, uh, re between the Federalists and I believe it was a Democrats. Um, Whigs, I think. The, yeah, the Whigs, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just the article here goes on to talk about a lot about the divide between the two parties, the hotly contested elections that became so vitriolic that Abigail Adams insisted that the opposition press be uh, suppressed to avoid a civil war, the Federalist Congress by passing the Sedition Act, limiting press attacks to be manifestly subversive of serving that the Republican press might provoke war with Britain, why members of the Republican press were threatened with imprisonment. The Republicans led by Madison and Jefferson responded to sc securing scourge of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, calling on the states to join in protesting the Federalist offensive against the constitutional right to a free press, so on and so forth, you know. With Jefferson's defeat of Adams in the 1800 presidential election, Sedition Act, with its attendant threat to a free press, died quietly. The Federalists relished the opportunity to attract freely their nemesis, Thomas Jefferson, with the election of the father of the Constitution, James Madison, to the presidents in 1808, in the beginning of the Second War of Independence against Britain. Press attacks reached a new crescendo. The pro-British press vilified the president, even threatening his life. The pro-Madison press responded, calling the administration's opponents Tories and traitors, even though we seldom hear of lives being threatened. In the pages of the contemporary press, partisan attacks of the press of the founding era, nonetheless, kind of sound familiar. You know, so what I'm simply saying is this. Um, the journalistic deal of having things uh, neutral and fact finding has only been around since probably the development of television and perhaps maybe some of the uh, reactions to the 1895 main incident with uh, some of the press by uh, you know the, the, the what's who's the guy who said if it bleeds it leads um, you know it's only been around for a short time and what's happening now with the development of the internet is we're kind of getting back to normal with history with a lot of partisan attacks, a lot of uh, misinformation out there. But, you know, what are we going to do to stop it? I think the one thing we do do is just let them speak. Because even here at the College of Complexes, we give a guy enough rope that he can hang himself, you know. <laughs> We've done this with several conspiracy theorists already. And even me, I'm quite shocked to see what I've found a few times, you know, like uh, just to give you an example of a little bit of the uh, press of the uh, some of the freedoms being taken away my my own youtube account was again put on a probation because of a, of a of an incident we had a few years ago from a talk called the moon landing hoax well youtube thinks five years later that uh the the uh that that the topic was not applicable we also had another one taken down called the uh, pizza gate and i am not sure what some of these guys do, but if they would take a look at the lectures and some of the online participation, they would see that we're not uh, cyber bullying or any of the other accusations. But with YouTube, you only get one chance to appeal. And if you don't uh, uh, win the appeal, you're, you get a strike in your account. And some with, with me, with over 1,200 videos up, that would be something if I was ever shut down. Well, fortunately, it's backed up. But, uh, you know, it's getting to be... Uh, when a talk like the moon landing hoax can get yeah, but he talked about all sorts of conspiracy. Yeah. So it wasn't just the moon landing. I know. And I'm just saying, you know, you know, well, then he was, it was what I'm simply saying is because that, he talked oh, about conspiracy. What I'm simply general. saying, I know what I'm simply saying is that, you know, when a guy, when a YouTube company can ban a, a innocent talk like that, something it's not innocent. You mean with yeah, the but, landing hoax? Yeah, but, yeah, but, but the opposite word there, Charlie, is company. It's not. It's not like you're simply stopping you from speaking. It's just saying you can't advertise in my newspaper. Okay. Well, anyway, I just thought I'd uh, contribute to it a little bit that fake news is nothing new. That the partisan deals are nothing new, and that uh, you know many of the things that we've had happening are nothing new. It's just we're, we're going back to history in the way it's a lot of times been. Okay, that's enough of my thing. I'm going to let Charlie go now for another seven minutes if he's ready. Yeah, all right. Um, I'll cover um, five issues here. First of all, um, the idea of having more, more political parties, there's a downside to that is that you're, you're opening it up 
to lunatic fringe parties. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. certain if good government is served by uh, necessarily, you say, oh, all, all, all speech will produce positive results. Uh, you're opening a door. We've had any number of lunatic fringe parties uh, who will be given the, the podium, so to speak. Um, I'm not certain if that, that's a way of achieving good government. Is that every single political party, you know, has a contribution to make to to elevate the, the conversation. Uh, that's an, a, an assertion that uh, is an absolute, which is not acceptable. Number two, term limits are, are nonsensical. There's no occupation in in this nation that there's no study that indicates in any occupation that after a certain period of time, the person doing the, doing the, uh, the occupant in the position goes bad. I know of no study. Seniority is a factor that's recognized as a positive attribute in union, every union contract in the United States and on every resume. People, that's what I say. You go out and you get experience, and you require that as as something as something in order to get a job. Now you're saying because somebody has accrued experience, they should you should get rid of them, which is again a nonsensical position. I don't know of any study that indicates how many years you are in a particular occupation that suddenly you become quote ineffective. And until you can do that. Now, the last thing is on term limits is that there's absolutely no assurance that the new people you bring in are going to be better. As a matter of fact, they could, in fact, be worse, completely ineffective. So this is what you want to do. Let's change personnel for no other reason to change personnel. And with the hope, we can only hope that they are better, but there's no assurance whatsoever. They can, in fact, be crooks and criminals. Oh, so that's what I mean. Now that you take a look at your assertions from all angles. The other thing is regarding the death penalty, as a, anybody with any degree of knowledge of history knows, and uh, our friend from UK even noted that, is that it's not a good idea for any government to take the life of its own citizens. They've never done that properly. It has not improved any society, but since they're incapable of doing it properly, perhaps we shouldn't do it at all. Now, I was at a conference today, earlier today, on social justice, and they went, you were asking facts and figures, is that if, I, if you are, quote, a person of privilege, P-R-I-V-I-L-E-G, in this nation, you are not likely, one, to ever go to jail, and two, you will not be executed. So that's that's what the situation is here right now. And um, you are simply opening the door up. Uh, you'll be executing anyone who is not who is without privilege. So that's what you want to do. Oh, good idea, guys. Um, now, three, getting back to IVI. IVI doesn't, they take, they actually have written positions on all issues. You can go to the website and look these up. You may have missed that. They vote as a group organization. Do we support or not support a particular action. And these are then, if it's positive, if they vote to do so, then, then, then it gets incorporated into the positions in which you can look these up. It covers all kinds of topics on the site. And the new issues come up. Which position does IVI take regarding it? It's debated and discussed, it, sometimes quite lengthy debates. And then it is voted on what position do we take? So Bob's uh, asked versions that 
we're all lefties or whatever is not the case. There is the process for what positions does IVI take on a particular issue and do they apply those positions to people who are candidates? Do you agree with IVI positions or not agree? It's a simple process. Now, the other thing I'd like to add is, as one of the long-term chairs, is that IVI doesn't disappear between elections. We lobby all the time for and against legislation or uh, elements going on within the community of government. Part of my job is I do a monthly report on what legislation I've contacted oh. members of Congress that we are in favor of or perhaps against. So I give a report, what are the current issues? The premier, the, I try to single out the most important issues that are in Congress being discussed during that previous 30 day period. And do we, I regularly notify members of the Illinois delegation, both electronically and hard copy and in person uh, by going to Washington on what is IVI's position regarding this matter. So it is an ongoing organization between elections. Um, and last of all, um, it's a good organization to member, become a member. Uh, it's not terribly expensive. I think it's a, they are very good uh, use the use of funds that they have available. They don't take corporate funding. And I highly recommend that everyone, even if you're of limited means, it's only $15. I think everyone could conceivably afford that. Anyhow, that's about it. Okay, thank you, Tim. You did a good job. Uh, take it over again. Okay, uh, thanks everybody tonight. Uh, um, Elvin, go ahead. You want to rebut a little bit? Okay. Go ahead. Um, First, I'll just put, give one of the arguments that I, I had that was quite compelling on the death penalty. If you are a country like Rwanda, and if you cast your mind about the terrible genocide that happened there, uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed with machetes and stuff, you, and you do not have the resources to incarcerate people for life, you uh, all have lengthy trials, and you need to quell the civil unrest, and you need to have these people punished quickly and decisively, then, yeah, you know, you've, you've got to implement a death penalty. By saying either Britain or America or whatever should have a death penalty, we're equating ourselves with that kind of situation. If, you, if it can be avoided, it, we should, it should take pride in the fact that you don't need it. Um, but the, the one I wanted to ask was, the general question, um, Britain has rescinded, you saw on the law and order, Britain's rescinded its double jeopardy law. Uh, I know you guys have got it in your constitution. How, Bob especially, how, how would you feel about rescinding that law in America? And bear in mind, the, 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 the second prosecutions have got to get a a very, very high bar. We're talking about, uh, you know, incontrovertible forensic evidence, DNA mostly. Um, the rape and murder that happened, you know, years ago when 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 the technology wasn't there, you know. So, how would you feel about receiving the double jeopardy law, you guys? <laughs> double jeopardy. I, um, I'm glad we have it. Well, would you be glad you have it if one of your family was murdered and the, guy, the person got away with it and it was later found out that he was guilty? Um, I'm sure they could file no charges or something like that, you know. Um, but if it was determined by a court law that the guy was innocent... I mean, when you say, when you say <laughs> a, 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 an innocent law... You, you could always define a mistrial and some other legal remedies that could probably <laughs> reopen the case. You know, that type of thing. Mm. I mean, I, uh, you know, there's always other remedies like a mistrial or something else, but I'm generally glad we have it because you can only be prosecuted once for a crime. And if he's found guilty later on, 
there's always a mistrial or a mis mis well, yeah, well, if, if the person if the person's acquitted and you know i mean you say that the prosecution can ask for a mistrial years afterwards you know that doesn't happen that, you know you're caught by double jeopardy there. I mean, the only difference is it will be a state trial and it will be a federal or a military trial. Sheldon, I don't think anybody here is qualified to get into this <clears throat> issue. Well, if, so, if somebody if, uh, if somebody's somebody in prison is qualified to and then new out. evidence if, if somebody's in prison and then yeah, you, got, you can appeal. You can appeal against the conviction. Uh, evidence is Sorry, Bob, you're breaking up, mate. Bob, you're breaking up again. All right. Anyway, at this point, I'm going to officially close out the. Tim, column. Tim, don't please don't have dinner while you're cheering. He's having a cookie. <laughs> yeah, I know, but please. All right. I'll... Yeah, the smell driving is crazy. Too. You can't wait until you're done. Yeah, uh, the, the smell driving is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> smell of vision. All right. Well, we'll we'll do is we'll light up. There we go. There we go. Okay. Anyway, what I'll do then is uh, I'll just close out tonight's college. We'll continue this discussion offline as I feel it might be around. So thank you everybody for attending. The College of Complexes is officially closed for tonight. And if you wanna continue the conversation offline, go ahead. We'll declare the College of Complexes tonight officially adjourned.